It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleagues uh, and peers and often mentors, Lauren Henderson at Boston Children's Hospital and Grant Schulert at Cincinnati Children's, who are going to talk to you about refractory systemic J and MAS. I think, are we just fielding questions? Yeah, is I mean, that, I, don't, uh, I didn't oh. prepare anything and, and I don't think Lauren did as well. I well mean, that, I, I that's think, fine. Um, um, with questions. Um, you know. So, so I mean, maybe I think we can we, start with I, Mike's question and maybe we yeah. can bring in Mike. So Michael Umbrello is- well, uh, Mike, um, Tara, can you spotlight Mike Umbrello? Mike, you, you might need to turn on your video for us to spotlight. Mike is uh, a uh, independent investigator I don't know, the NIH has different titles for everything. Um, Mike runs an amazing program at uh, the Intramural uh, National Institutes for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases in Bethesda and has been studying the genetics of systemic JA and other inflammatory disease for a long time. Um, and his question, which I will pointedly pose to Dr. Henderson and then Dr. Schuler, is what do you do when they develop MAS on canakinumab? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Go ahead, Grant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really important question, right? And to me, I think the the question is what what caused the MAS? You know, was there sort of a clear identified infectious trigger? You know, the the clinical trial experience with canakinumab, as well as I think my lived practice experience with canakinumab, is that you know patients are still at risk for developing MAS flares with viral infections, um, you know, influenza, other common seasonal viruses. Um, and, you know, it's something like that, I think it's a different story than somebody who is sort of unable to have sort of full disease control on canakinumab and continues to have flares with either overt or subclinical MAS features. I think those are very different states. Um, Lauren, yeah, I would agree. I think often after a viral infection, um, sometimes switching from canakinumab to anakinra can be beneficial. Um, I, it's easier to give anakinra at a higher dose, which we sometimes need in macrophage activation syndrome. Um, and I have found that some of my patients do better with macrophage activation syndrome on anakinra. Um, and that might be due to dosing. It may be due to the fact that anakinra hits a slightly different IL-1 target than canakinumab. We don't know for sure. But I completely agree with Grant that if a patient is constantly in subclinical MAS on IL-1 blockade, canakinumab or anakinra, it's really time to switch to a different class. And we're really fortunate right now because we do have other classes like um, JAK inhibitors I've had success with. Um, and even I've had success using the new medication emipalumab, which targets interferon gamma, which um, Dr. Canna was talking about, even for a short course and then resetting back onto canakinumab. Uh, and actually, um, Lauren, one question as a follow-up to that, uh, did you, it, when you talked about resetting as a follow-up to that, did you find that the need for the IL-1 inhibition, et cetera, reduced after imapalumab, or was it, did it just kind of go back to where it was, the disease was? So, you know, I've... I haven't used Emipalumab, like everyone here, I haven't used it extensively. I've used it in a couple of patients, which is probably a lot for any of the physicians out there. Um, you know, I've, I've had a patient where, a couple patients where it just felt like the CXCL9, that the interferon gamma marker was going up, the IL-18 was going up. There was just such a big inflammatory cytokine burden in this patient, these patients, and I couldn't control it. And I gave three doses of Emipalumab and all those numbers came down and we were able to go back on an outpatient regimen. Um, but this is a very you know, limited experience. This is one of the new tools we have to treat MAS, which is great. And we're all learning the best way to use it. I see a question from Anna Karen. Um, uh, which JAK in, uh, inhibitor do you use? So what's interesting is, uh, and then I'm sure Grant has things to say, which interesting, when you look at the biology, we would think that certain JAK inhibitors, especially ones that hit JAK1 and 2, might be the best. 
like ruxolitinib or baricitinib, but I've actually had success with tofacitinib, surprisingly. Yeah. That's all I could get approved. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, um, so in the US, you know, as most of you or many of you know, tofacitinib was recently approved by the FDA for polyarticular course GIA. Um, there were systemics um, in those clinical trials, um, although they did not have, um, they didn't have MAS um, and they had to have a particular significant uh, joint involvement of their disease. Um, but, um, but I think that approval uh, by the FDA has uh, greatly increased the access to uh, tofacitinib in the US. And in the early part of 2021, there will be a liquid formulation that'll be on the market, which was part of the label uh, that the FDA approved, which will also be really, really nice. Um, so I've used TOFA most, again, mainly because of our clinical trial experience here. I've, I, have, I have, have had and have patients in the clinical trials, um, so I have the most experience with tofacitinib. Um, others, as Anna notes, um, uh, they've used ruxolitinib. Um, I know others have used baricitinib um, as well um, with, um, with good response. You know, I think just as we see with the TNF agents and with anakinrib versus canakinumab, there is likely going to be differential response within patients. And somebody having an incomplete response to, so, to vasitinib doesn't mean they're not gonna have a better response to something like baricitinib or rexolitinib. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much to guide us. Um, Petrus, do you have any experience from, um, from adult patients, either with RA or with stills uh, with the JAK inhibitors? Yeah, I mean, I've used it quite a bit. Um, obviously more tafacitinib than uh, anything else. Uh, but uh, I agree with you. I'm a little um, intrigued by baricitinib and uh, possibly a more targeted uh, JAK in inhibition that may be more relevant for auto-inflammatory, but there's a complete dearth of information. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's stopping us. And the other thing, obviously, is uh, access, right? So access is, is uh, harder um, within your JAKs, um, and maybe tofacitinib has a advantage being longer in the market. But I find that uh, they're well-tolerated drugs and uh, maybe, maybe they're, they're, they're good for combination treatment. We, we don't know yet, but I've heard a lot of anecdotal um, cases with, uh, you know, combination on one inhibitors and jacks uh, that apparently, you know, did well. So yeah. so yeah, there's been a request to use both names. Uh, recognizing the sort of uh, yeah. alphabet soup that these drugs are. So tofacitinib goes by the lovely name Zeljans, which is begins with an X, of course. Because <laughs> um, we don't want to make even the brand names easy. Right. <laughs> uh, Ruxolitinib goes by the name Jacophy. Uh, and baricitinib goes by the name Olumiant. Which is really um, better. And there's at least a half a dozen others. I think upadacitinib is um i don't know what the trade is but i think i'm sorry yeah. rainbow i think the key point is that there's a these jack inhibitors are a whole new class of medications there are many different medications in this class and they're likely to be effective for sga and mas and it's really exciting yeah, and yeah. Exactly, we have all these funny names that are hard to understand that means we have a lot of different drugs that might work for one patient or another patient yeah but this yeah. is great news yeah. yeah. And you know, Dr. Horn noted that there's a clinical trial for ruxolitinib in HLH uh, ongoing at St. Jude's. Um, again, because along with sort of the, you know, some of the pathways that Scott highlighted, and I actually really like that color-coded slide you had, uh, Scott, showing the jackanibs and others, um, but it also really has a lot of role in interferon pathways um, and so the use in HLH and MAS. Uh, as well as in sort of the interferonopathies, uh, is uh, is I think a big um, a big utility of these medicines as well, um, and several of them are in clinical trials for uh, coronavirus, which I think we're talking about later in the morning. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's uh, one question in the comments about side effects, um, and and maybe we can open that up to not just side effects of the JAK inhibitors, but but maybe side effects of the others. Um, I'm going to pick on Dr. Grom about uh, his experience with side effects of JAK inhibitors in his patients. Well, a couple of things. Um, the 
first thing, as you know, the growth hormone signals through JAKs. So there is a bit of a concern that uh, JAK inhibitors may potentially affect the growth. Uh, the other thing, uh, a um, molecule called erythropoietin, something that stimulates production of red blood cells, also signals uh, through, um, uh, through JAKs. So blocking those um, uh, signaling pathways, we potentially may induce anemia uh, as well as some other cytopenias, but also the other concern is the growth. Um, and it's actually a very, very difficult balance to achieve. In fact, um, we now have a, a very unpleasant experience with using the growth hormone to overcome some of the effects of JAK inhibitors when we achieved a good response initially, but um, the patient was not growing. So we decided to uh, counterbalance uh, and, and treat the patient with a growth hormone. And in fact, we provoked a major, major flare of the disease. So I think what happened, uh, we, uh, with the growth hormone therapy, we reactivated mm -hmm. some of the signaling pathway that we were trying to block with uh, JAK inhibitors and, and, and trigger the flare. So, my point is that the experience with JAK inhibitors in our, in our patient population in systemic JIA is still limited, but we need to keep uh, this, this potential side effect in mind, uh, and uh, we need experience to understand it better. And I'm not even mentioning the, the infectious complications that always need to be um, uh, kept in mind. Yeah, I, I will jump onto that. Just having a little sort of secondhand experience with using pretty high doses of, of some JAK inhibitors, particularly baricitinib, in other sort of more rare genetic inflammatory diseases. The, the growth and the anemia um, are certainly concerns, but surprisingly not as much. Uh, you know, they actually saw some catch up growth because they're able to get some patients off steroids. Um, and, and improvement of anemia because inflammation was a little bit better. So um, what they did see in some of those studies, and I think one of the, the things is, you know, these drugs are not all the same. And I certainly think of the JAK inhibitors, especially the doses we would use them at, uh, as being substantially more immunosuppressive than certainly the IL-1 inhibitors. Um, and in some of those studies, you know, there were some viral reactivations uh, in the adult rheumatoid arthritis studies, there was a lot of like chicken pox reactivation in the older folks that got it um, and, and something called BK virus in some of the younger children. So, you know, um, I think we have a lot to learn about the, the efficacy and safety, but I also think that uh, we have a good bit to learn about um, the context and, and how these interact with other immunosuppressives and, and whether we should be looking out for infections more and more with these. In Cincinnati, if I start JAK inhibitors, I immediately get a phone call from our pharmacist uh, insisting on initiating antifungal and anti herpes prophylaxis. And I don't know whether uh, Dr. Goldbachmanski or anyone from her team is on the, the call, but I think their experience of using um, baricitinib in the interferonopathies, I think, was that they needed quite high doses. And some of that I think is biology, right? I think the biology of autoinflammation is very different from the biology of RA, which is where a lot of the dosing is from. Um, but I think it's also, I think some of the metabolism, and especially in young kids, they had to use sort of per size dosages that were five to 10 times higher than the approved RA dose. Um, and I think some of that is just how they're metabolized by the body as well as the biology of the disease. I also think, you know, all of us, is rheumatologists who are treating these patients, our goal is to control the disease and then get patients on the lowest amount of immunosuppression possible. I think sometimes what can happen is once we get control, we can go down on lower doses that are safer. Um, that's always our goal, get off steroids, get on the lowest dose of immunosuppression we can so that our patients can do well. Yeah, and I think there's a difference in the US versus uh, um, uh, Europe for the, for the JAX because in Europe, the higher doses are approved um, for baricitinib, you know, the four milligrams, which apparently was the only one that showed efficacy in lupus, right? Um, not the lower dose. Um, also, there is another JAG, um, 
uh, that uh, was approved in Europe but didn't make it here, um, that didn't actually have a, a shingles uh, signal, uh, filgotin, right? That's what I'm talking about. Um, so I think there, I agree, there are differences uh, between the representatives of the, the class and uh, I think the higher dose may be useful, at least initially, until we get control, but uh, we're more limited here because only the lower dose was approved. And in a rate makes sense, but in other disease states, the, the dosing does make a difference. So, so uh, there is a question, and maybe we should move away JAK inhibitors a little bit, uh, about IBD in, as a complication of IL-1 treatment. Um, that has not been my experience. I think um, <laughs> to get back on, on my, my horse about disease versus syndrome, I wish it wasn't called inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, because it's a syndrome. It's a collection of dozens of different diseases, some of which will respond to IL-1 blockade and others may get worse with IL-1 blockade. And so um, what I think we have seen, and I still don't have a good explanation for, is patients who seem to be responding to IL-1 inhibition, but their liver enzymes jump way up. Um, and that I think is, is something that you know we need to keep an eye on and, and is often complicated because we're starting these drugs in patients who are sick for a variety of reasons and might have liver abnormalities for a variety of reasons. So any other side effects you want to make sure that our audience is aware of? Yeah, the liver question is a really interesting and complicated one because there can be liver inflammation in the acute disease of systemic GIA. There can be very significant liver involvement in MAS. Um, and there can also be um, liver anakinra-induced liver injury. Actually, Dr. Kanna wrote one of the early reports of that when he was still a baby-faced trainee. <laughs> um, but, um, but you can see drug-induced injury, uh, liver injury. Um, and so sorting out what is going on, is the drug the problem or is the uncontrolled the disease the problem, um, is, is very complicated. And, I, I, uh, and even sort of when there is a liver biopsy, sometimes it's not super black and white as I, some of the families that I know who are uh, part of the, this, this meeting here can, can attest to. <laughs> All right, so, so I'm gonna shift to um, my current bugaboo. We've talked a lot about the systemic side of systemic GIA, but classically, um, the part of systemic GIA that has been, you know, the hardest to treat has actually been the arthritis. Uh, and there's this hypothesis about this window of opportunity. But nevertheless, I think that we're all still following, and I'm sure some of our, our listeners uh, are dealing with uh, really, really refractory arthritis that seems to be different than other GIA arthritis and different than RA. Um, what are people's my personal experience with that has been that it's been profoundly frustrating and disabling, um, but I'd be interested in others. I'd be interested in hearing Dr. Grom's experience as the, uh, the senior of our pediatrician group here. Well, um, it is a very challenging group. Um, and uh, certainly even at the arthritic stage, uh, this disease is, the nature of this disease is very different from other subtypes of juvenile angiopathic arthritis. So this is again a focus of several clinical trials right now, uh, including a couple of JAK inhibitors. I believe there is a clinical, ongoing clinical trial of baricitinib and um, there was another one. And if you look at the inclusion criteria, specifically those trials are looking for patients with Poly articular course of the disease, and many of those patients will have systemic onset. So I think um, soon we should have some answers whether whether JAK inhibitors might be uh, the answer there. And again, if if it is helpful, what type of JAK inhibitors would be the best? So there are ongoing clinical trials to specifically address this issue, and I believe Hermina Brunner is a PI on a couple of them. And, and just to interject, uh, because I think Lauren's going to talk, but I wanted to address this question too. So um, Leah had a great question, which is that, you know, um, sometimes we're dealing with the primary disease and sometimes we're dealing with the fallout of the disease. And when you have a patient that's in a lot of pain, how do you separate 
what is pain from joint destruction or osteoarthritis really versus maybe some pain amplification because these kids have chronic disease versus you know primary ongoing disease. I think that's it's it, it can be really difficult, and that's where having a really close relationship with your rheumatologist is really important. And that's you know often we'll see patients every three months, really, so you can do an exam and track changes over time and figure out if a joint is warm, um, which would indicate active arthritis. And sometimes on exam you can't even tell, and you have to rely on imaging. So sometimes I'll use ultrasound, or if I'm really uncertain, I'll use MRI. And mainly I use those imaging techniques when I'm questioning is there active disease here that may means I need to change treatment so that I know where I'm going. Um, but it, it's very difficult. Yeah, Lauren, I agree with you. I think that's where the ultrasound becomes very, very important, particularly if you combine it with some inflammatory markers like S100 proteins, it could be very helpful. But I think it's worth pointing out that these things can coexist. Uh, I follow a patient right now and we did an MRI of his hips that showed active arthritis, um, something called avascular necrosis, as well as a ton of joint destruction and osteoarthritis. And so, you know, all of these things can coexist at the same time. And, and it's really, you know, it's refractory. It's, it's the reason we're having this kind of conference. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, this runs across the subtypes of JIA. You know, certainly we're talking specifically about systemics here. But I think there, you know, there's also a proportion of patients with other polyarticular course JIA who have a significant reduction in their sort of overt signs of inflammation, you know, the thickening, the fluid, but um, have really um, significant um, chronic pain that's not addressed by our current therapeutic approaches. And, uh, and I think it's a huge... Um, it's a huge area of need uh, for um, both um, research uh, to understand what's happening uh, and then uh, understanding what are going to be the best approaches, whether it's um, Medicaid, medical physiotherapy or both um, that's, that's needed. But I also think that, um, at least on the adult side, that many times we're uh, timid about the dose and some of the really refractory arthritis really needs us to think outside the box and go up on the dose and, you know, and I'm sure all of us have used uh, a higher dose of, um, uh, of kanakinumab or nakinra or uh, infusion of uh, Actema every 10 days, which sometimes was the only thing that, that, that helped for the patient. So um, I think thinking outside the traditional dosing for, uh, for, other, for array and other diseases uh, can uh, often help those refractory patients. We doing on time. We're doing well on time. Um, so I, I am going to say there's there's some really great questions in the comments. Um, I am going to say that we're we're going to sort of conspicuously avoid making specific comments or on on specific patients for reasons that um, you know for a variety of reasons. Um, I do want to sort of also point out that you know this panel probably constitutes some of the lunatic fringe of. Uh, aggressive treatment. Uh, it would be over the edge if Dr. Cron were on, of course. Um, but I, I want to bring up something that I do a lot, um, which is stacking of new medicines. You know, I, I think that many of us have no problems adding methotrexate to a TNF inhibitor. Um, but, you know, when it comes to our kinds of patients, I think that there's often a lot of trepidation to say, you're on a Loris, and let's think about adding potentially another biologic or another medicine, uh, or do we need to always be switching? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in others' experiences with, with, with stacking medicines that others would probably want a patient to switch. I'm also curious about the European doctors, if they have any different ways of dealing with such complex issues of stacking. I see Bas, uh, I see Marco Caterno, uh, Michael Umbrella is also back. So if any of you want to add comments here. I mean, I think uh, I can uh, try. Yeah. So please. we have, um, <clears throat> of course, um, we also have experience with these refractory uh, patients and uh, 
in general, we, we avoid stacking uh, biological drugs. Um, I think the most important reason is that we have several options before we need to, st uh, uh, to stack. We do combine um, low or medium dose uh, uh, steroids, corticosteroids, to, um, to a new biological, at least for a certain amount of time. Um, but then again, I, I uh, acknowledge that, uh, that um, sometimes it is not possible to, to be completely in an active disease on one biological, uh, even if you uh, combine it with a very low dose um, corticosteroids uh, or, or methotrexate. So um, um, we have now a first child on a biologic and, and, um, and a JAK inhibitor. So uh, this is also, I think a lack of, of uh, uh, large scale experience and um, um, in the field and in, in, in Europe, in our country as well. So, so um, I, wa I want you to stay on uh, boss. Thank you for joining because I want to add into this one issue before we leave, which is actually something I poo-pooed in my talk, but something that we've done and actively considering in some patients, which is actually bone marrow transplant. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing in the in the comments that are patients who are on high dose anakinra, alaris, methotrexate, steroids, all the same time. At a certain point, when you know, do we make the decision to to bring in our hematopoietic stem cell transplant colleagues? There are data trials in severe refractory systemic J and stills that uh, are actually fairly strong. Yes, so I, I agree. So we had a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation program um, in uh, the first decade of this century. Actually, before the, um, the era of targeted biological therapy, at least that it was uh, registered. Um, and we, uh, uh, you know the papers, so we are in total in Europe, I guess we have, I thought, 37 or some, somewhere between 35 and 40. Those were all autologous uh, stem cell transplantations. Hmm. Autologous because uh, it was expected that the risk for um, mortality was, uh, of course, at that time uh, still significantly lower than um, than um, um, uh, non autologous So um, allogeneic, yeah, yeah, allogeneic. Thanks, uh, Grant, for the word. Allogeneic uh, stem cell transplantation. Um, and we stopped the program, I think, around 2009 or 10, when the uh, newer biologists became available. In the past three years, we have been uh, we have had consultation uh, conversations with patients from other centers and from our center as well on on uh, at least to to uh, evaluate with each other what are the would be the reasons to do or not to do an autologous or an allogeneic uh, stem cell transplantation in this era. And this is a very difficult situation. Um, one of my colleagues from uh, stem cell transplantation also describes it, it it's, it's, it's discussing a moment in which you have to jump through a burning hoople, is that an English word? You take a risk in advance, uh, which is not, uh, which is a significant risk, uh, and, and you have to uh, know that, that also uh, the data from, at least from uh, the European experience is, is okay, but not perfect. So uh, approximately half of them um, we're in disease, uh, in medication-free uh, remission afterwards, which is incredible if you think of, of uh, the disease load that they had before, but it's still not, uh, it's still only 50%. And in the other 50%, there are some people that died from the, uh, from the treatment, uh, at that time around uh, 12 to 15%, um, around 20% uh, that still had persistent uh, disease activity requiring biological therapy. So you can, uh, discussed, but not much improved prior to them uh, versus the situation prior to stem cell and approximately 20%, uh, 10 to 20% had still had maintenance therapy, but really in lower uh, doses and lower uh, uh, weight of therapy than before. So, and of course, uh, besides the mortality, it also has a uh, significant implication for, for other uh, important aspects of life. For example, for, um, the ability to raise children uh, and get children yourself, uh, uh, the, the fertility uh, and children. So this is not an easy discussion. Yeah, I, I, I second that, that I think for us that our program transplant would be really the last means of treatment of refractory systemic JIA. 
um, because of those significant side effects. And um, I think that would be often a time where there might be a subgroup of patients with refractory disease. What we might be concerned might have an underlying immunodeficiency that we don't really fully understand. And that would be really a time where we would expand the diagnostic evaluation of those patients, potentially doing something like whole exome sequencing, working closely with our immunology colleagues. But this would really be um, the treatment of last resort um, for us at Boston Children's. Can I, can I, why the treatment of last resort? I mean, it, these are case studies, but some of the patients, there's been a few patients in our group who have un, ended up, you know, going with the bone, bone marrow transplant. And at least, you know, this one patient who had the lung issue, now that she's the only child in all these patients I know with lung issues who's actually living a good life now. And um, it was a very hard first year after the transplant. It was, you know, it was touch and go at several points. Um, but, you know, all of us are living these protracted years of what you call stacking. I mean, when a doctor is stacking medications, it's because that patient is, you know, not being controlled by anything else. So why, why the reluctance to think about transplant? I think it, in our oh, Go ahead, Lauren. No, I think it, in, in our experience, it's because of that very high upfront risk that the transplant um, might go poorly um, or that there'll be long-term side effects from the transplant. Um, and that often when you go into a transplant with a lot of inflammation for years and years and years, the transplant can be much more complicated. Um, then for example, a, a patient who's transplanted as an infant without a long-term history of autoimmunity. Um, and then I think we have a lot of exciting medications coming up on the horizon, um, you know, in the, uh, um, that are coming out on the market that will really give us better options to control refractory JA. It, it's not that we don't use it. It just really, for us, it would be something that we would think about after we've gone through every other option for those reasons. I very much agree with Lauren. Like the sort of in Cincinnati, if you if if talk to our BMT people, correct, sort of the numbers on average, the mortality rate is close to 30%, but, but when a patient has uncontrolled inflammatory disease, some organ damage, particularly when it comes to the lungs, our people here, our transplanters in Cincinnati believe that the risk is much, much, much higher. And that's the main reason for, for the reluctance uh, to proceed. Yeah, it, it is, again, another double-edged sword because you know the ideal time to do a transplant is when a patient's not sick but you're never going to transplant damage. a patient who's not desperately ill. And so there's never a situation, and, and, and we're in this right now, um, where, where you're not going to be dealing with, with you know, the, the sort of combination and trade-off between their sort of ongoing morbidity, um, raising the risk of transplant, uh, but being the reason for the fact that you're considering it at all. I, I think that, um, it's such an individualized situation that it's hard to generalize and say, but I think Lauren's point is well taken, that you're going to exhaust a lot of therapeutic opportunities first. You're going to do a lot uh, more investigation to sort of potentially de-risk it if you can find a very good reason why they should get a transplant. Um, and at least in our institution, with some of the reduced intensity conditioning regimens that everybody's using these days, uh, and, and the data from the autologous not being great, they're doing mostly aloe, uh, meaning bone marrow coming from not the same person. Um, but, you know, even under the best of circumstances, the, the risk uh, with a, a, an eight of eight match is probably still five to 10% mortality. Um, and, and that is a lot. As, uh, as, as any of you can imagine. But maybe we and should I think some of it is that. also, uh, sorry, Rashmi, you go. Maybe we should compare that risk of mortality to with what the risk of mortality for a child who is refractory and on like, you know, 10 of these medications for three years or something. I think that's the, when you compare it with like, you know, mortality in regular SGIA, that's not relevant. We have to look at, you know, apples to apples and to then I to see what are the best options for these patients. I totally agree with you, Rashmi. So I, 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 I think um, maybe you feel it, but I, I don't think it's it's reluctant of doctors not to talk about stem cell transplantation, but it's, it's very hard, like Scott says, to generalize. And I would encourage, actually, if the, uh, the, the registered or the easy options are, uh, are, are out, 
to have a consultation with the stem cell uh, transplantation doctor and your pediatric rheumatologist to discuss the um, the odds and the uh, chances because it's re in the end it's it's uh, the patient and the parents that need to uh, to also uh, live with this uh, and and take the risk and 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 uh, any unknown therapy is is not without risk as well just like you say yeah I, I agree but maybe with we do not know what, exactly the risk with with what Bas said that I think that we should be at least discussing it as an option um, when we're getting to the point where we're stacking multiple medicines and using supra approved doses of, of therapies um, and dealing with significant morbidity from refractory disease. I, I think another barrier, which I think is hard for us to say as doctors is because it's not something that we do as rheumatologists. And it's, you know, that I don't know if there's some reluctance to sort of say we're giving up, there's nothing else we can do for you and we need you to see one of the, the cancer doctors, you know. Um, I, but I think that we should be, we should be introducing this into the conversation. Um, I have a couple of patients I'm involved with who are in various points of exploring that that path, um, because you're exactly right. It's a it's a significant mortality, but so is some of the current regimens that our patients are on, which are not even then fully controlling their disease. Yeah, 